for like this little. So this was an Oldsmobile seat controller from like a '80s Oldsmobile that I turned into an Atari joystick. And the also the idea is, cars are full of good stuff you can use for things that have nothing to do with cars. And modern cars are going to be even more so. So in 10 or 15 years, when this current generation of cars starts ending up in junkyards, there are going to be treasure troves of sensors and motors and switches and all these things that run on 12 volts. And 12 volts is a great kind of environment to run stuff because there's car batteries are plentiful and cheap. When if you imagine the same as the car computers that will be in those cars, what if those platforms were in fact open source and that it could be upgraded or yeah. used in the future rather than them just being a computer that dies in the dust. Right. All the rest of the parts that are mechanical are, you know, taken from it. Yeah, there's and there's there's so much good stuff in cars that we can we can grab and turn into other things. Now of course there is the scary side of car hacking. Um, and there's you know there's there's this kind of fear and it's it's the media tends to overhype this fear I think. There's the idea that your car can somehow be taken over or controlled by evil people out there who want to run you into walls and things like that. Terrorists, and fashionistas, and whatever the hell is out there. So they, um, the idea that your car can be remotely taken over is true and not true. For one thing, no car right now can that happen to without some degree of physical contact. You'll have to get to the car and put something in that OBD2 port, some physical thing that can receive an outside signal. No, no car right now are you going to be able to just go up to any car with your phone and take it over. Right. Just or not hack it across hack. the internet with a botnet and somehow right. the fleet of you know pieces are taken over or something like that. It's not <laughs> impossible to think it might happen. A lot of car companies have concierge services like OnStar that can do things like remote start. I think you know they get data back from the car, so there is a good degree of connectivity in a lot of modern cars. But right now, for doing things like cutting off the brakes or changing the steering, that still requires a physical contact. However, if you get a little bit of physical contact and can clandestinely plug in something, you can do a lot. So these two guys, um, in, these two Spanish guys at a, re at a hacker conference just recently, demonstrated a device that costs 26 bucks. They itemized it. It's like a little Arduino and a couple other little controllers in there that basically gives them total access to a car. Everything in it. And the more advanced the car, the more they can control. And I believe they've got it so it's got like, I don't, it's got a Bluetooth connection and they're working on a 3G connection. So they can literally see all of the information coming from your car's computer. They can send signals to it. They can spoof it to have the odometer, or the right. speedometer, the tack, or the speed just go all the way up. Oh, yeah, exactly. They can slam on brakes. If your car is drive by wire, then they can increase throttle, put on the brakes. Uh, modern, some modern cars now, I think Infinity's got some, and a lot of them are going to electric power steering. Any car that has that self park system has an electric power steering system capable of moving the wheels independently. They would be able to get a hold of that. They even had a simple little trick where if you just start the car and then like cut off the power to the computer, <laughs> they can just brick your car immediately. You can restart, you can get it going again, but they said they were doing it to restart, but as yeah. like a prank. Yeah. Just wow. basically just like pulling the keys out of someone's car and just throwing them out yeah. the window. Kill it. So, I mean, it's not unheard of. The more and and the thing that they realized is there's extremely little security on what's called the CAN bus in a car. The CAN bus like a car is actually a whole network of computers that talk to each other. There's like the fuel injection computer and the airbag system has its own independent computer. And I think in a lot of cars there, you know, of course there's the infotainment and nav system. There's a lot of different computers, and the more advanced they get, the more they have, and they all talk to each other in the CAN bus, and there's not really much security inside that network. It's just simple checksum stuff, I think. I think if you can get in, it's not it's not rocket science. Well, and I think that was the idea, too, is that pe people, as in consumers or just the general public, weren't necessarily meant to access this information, no. but as technology has become cheaper, people are just doing this because they're interested into it, into it and because it's a challenge, and I think a lot of nerds, engineers, people like the challenge of doing something that may be impossible or may somebody may have failed to a certain point or gotten to a certain point and then stopped so that they can pick up that work and continue on and you just see it more and more. So I, I, once again, going back to the idea of a standard that is open so that people can contribute to a general you know, repository of something that is secure because I don't think one car company is going to tackle the whole standard yeah. either. Yeah, and it would have to be a, it's going to have to be an industry-wide standard, and there's, you know, the security is going to have to be figured out. Like, you want it open and hackable so people can mess with things, and you also want it so you can not have to worry about something you don't want hacking. And that's an important thing I thought, too, is that this is a technology specifically that you can be killed in, and that it's dangerous, right. and I think that that's an important thing to think about with safety and all those things, and 
why the boundaries haven't necessarily been put, haven't been pushed as far as they, they could have been. It's because of that, that safety regulation. Yeah, you can't run your phone into a wall and die. Well, you can run your phone into a wall. <laughs> so, um, and then there's car companies now that are kind of playing on the idea of, uh, well, pre-hacked car or open source cars or, you know, things like this. So, like, Tesla, for example, includes a lot of computers in their cars. There's like a huge iPad-like screen Android, right in the center. completely open source. I mean, I guess yeah. their distro is closed, but it, it's based on Android and just a huge 17-inch widescreen. When these monitor. things start ending up in junkyards, those things are going to be because mm -hmm. I bet you can do all kinds of cool shit. When that, the interesting thing is that they have APIs. So, for instance, this Google Glass and Tesla integration. So that I, I forgot actually what the functionality is. If it's to find a charging station or if Probably. it's to tell something. That's like the only thing you really give a shit. And Local Motors is fascinating. So they're a little company based out of Nevada. Yeah, Arizona or Nevada. And, and they're moving. Yeah, they're moving to Vegas, yeah. But they, this whole car platform is open source. So you can get all the plans. You can basically order it and kind of, you can build it yourself at their facility with their assistance. And it's a very advanced kind of, it's called the Rally Fighter, and it's a, like an off-road sports car type thing. Extremely expensive, it's like a hundred grand though, so it's not exactly like something anybody can just use and play with. But it is an, you know, an open platform, and it's, they've done a number of other um, uh, cars, bicycles, motorcycles as well, and it's, they're, they're interested in, in pushing the next generation of cars and vehicles in general, and they uh, just took a round of funding from uh, Vegas Tech Fund and we'll be moving to Vegas and opening a facility in which people will actually be able to come in, designers, engineers, and use their, their tools like their water jets and some of the more advanced uh, manufacturing techniques that a uh, local hacker space isn't gonna have, but someone who's hacking on this large car platform uh, will have, so. So they're interesting, because they're sort of a car manufacturer, but it's not like they have an assembly line, and they're all sort of hand-built, but the customer is kind of directly involved. It's an interesting idea, and I don't think it's going to get huge just because of the cost involved, yeah. but it's certainly an interesting start for something really, really and interesting. They're uh, specifically going to be printing a 3D printed car for a show uh, oh, yeah. at IMS in September, so that's pretty interesting that, that a company like this that's kind of the DIY hacker platformy kind of world is also embracing that 3D printed world, because actually some of the parts in the motorcycles, like the air cleaner, uh, work right off of the 3D printer. The production part is actually from the 3D printer, uh, whereas we normally think about 3D printing in terms of design and prototype. This is actually going out in production. Yeah, I know uh, 3D. I know um, one of the guys we work with occasionally, Jalopnik, is one of the people who runs Jay Leno's garage, and he has a lot of really vintage stuff where you can't get parts for them anymore. And they are already using 3D printing to create new, you know, little things, knobs for a dash of a cord that they can't get anymore, or a uh, Delahaye, and they'll. 3D print them, scan them, sometimes have them cast in metal. So it's actually already starting in cars to become very important 3D printing. I think that's actually an interesting point. And that, that's a real maker hacker technology, like a 3D printer and people yeah. that were doing the RepRap projects. They're putting those together in their garage, just trying to make a self-replicating printer so that everyone can have printers and, and such, and that the cost is so low. And then here it comes back down into a manufacturing process or where yeah. they use it as a part of making it cheaper and more accessible to cast the part. Because you, yeah, like the idea of casting one thing like that before would have been, you would be crazy. It's, it's you to cut that steel it. and do yeah. all that, I mean, just but now, so cost prohibitive. It's, it's gotten so much easier to do that, and it's, they're just getting started. We'll, we'll show a slide in a little bit of a full 3D car body that was printed for the Geneva show. There's amazing stuff. But first, I'm gonna bring, this is close to my heart because uh, this the, the basic Tesla chassis reminds me an awful lot of what used to be like the default car hackers platform. The old air-cooled VWs had a chassis that was separate from the body, had its own engine integrated drivetrain, and people would always make kit cars out of these things. I don't know if you remember, um, yeah, here we go, we'll look at the chassis. So there it is, and it's and this engine at the back, you can make like little, they had little 18 wheelers or crazy little vans or things that looked like old MG TVs. And in my neighborhood, I grew up in North Carolina, not a purely car heavy town, but in any given neighborhood, there were like five or so guys just putting one of these together with a fiberglass body, varying quality, some really sucked. But the thing is, you could drive these on the road. You could make your own car. And at the time, buying an old ratted out Beetle was like a $300 proposition. So it was road legal, reliable, efficient, parts were super easy to get a hold of. And the nature of it, separate body and chassis, is what really made this possible. Most modern cars are what they call unibody. There is no separate chassis. You can't really do this anymore. Except Tesla's kind of gone back. 
So this Tesla platform, they've got a rear engine, all the batteries in the floorboard. All of a sudden now we've got something with potentially changeable bodies on a platform. Well, like a, we, you had mentioned one time, it's the body of the Tesla didn't need to look like a car at all. I mean, a lot of the reasons that a car looks the way that it does is it has to have certain tolerances and places to fit an engine and the drivetrain right. going back. And, and that this allows for any kind of form factor, factor to be made on top of what is essentially a platform. And GM was working with this for a while with something called High Wire. The idea, they were calling it like a skateboard that would be a universal thing. And typical GM, they did all this advanced work and then they seem to have forgotten all about it. But essentially, Tesla's managed to build just that. Now, Tesla doesn't currently sell the chassis alone, but I think they should because it would be fantastic. If you could get a chassis with a VIN number, put whatever you want on it, like a little camper or whatever, and it'd be electric, and if they actually do get their infrastructure going so you could recharge it, that would be fantastic. This would really, in many ways, replace the old Beetle. It would probably be crazy expensive, though. So the only problem is the old Beetle is still a better choice in some ways because you can still do it for dirt cheap. And it's not completely legal. You can it's get still it registered. Legal. It's got a VIN number. number. <laughs> yeah. And now there are there is a company now making what they call an open source car, and it's remarkably the layout is remarkably like an old Beetle chassis. It's a simple platform frame, rear engine, two seats. The thing is, though, it's very small. It uses like a little one-cylinder, like 250cc engine. And in Europe, there's these quadricycle laws that make it legal. So you can drive these little four-cylinder, I'm sorry, four-wheeled things that are not quite a motorcycle, not quite a car. And you can drive them in cities. But in the U.S., we don't have that. So as cool as this is, and it's very cool. You can put the whole thing together in an hour. You can body it any way you want. In many ways, it's like the an Arduino of cars. It's like a hackable platform to do whatever. But if it's not road legal, who gives a shit? Because you want to be able to drive these things on the road, have fun with them. You know, you want it to be a car that you can use. So, in many ways, still the old Beetle Pan is still the only option until something like this gets cheap enough, or somebody else figures out how to scale up something like this into a reasonable way that you could actually make it legal. Maybe the U.S. needs. Uh, like, you know, airplanes have that experimental aircraft kind of category. So the problem is our safety and emissions requirements are so stringent. A little manufacturer making do-it-yourself vehicles, there's no way they can do it. There's ways around it. You make a three-wheeled vehicle, and then all the rules go away. Like, I test drove this thing called the T-Rex, which is basically like a motorcycle back half and two front wheels, and it's fucking terrifying. It's absolutely <laughs> terrifying. But it's fast, but it's... You know, barely. Somehow well, that's more safe than it's not more real safe, version but, of it. In yeah, itself. but legally, if you only have three wheels, you bypass airbags, you bypass everything. So you could do it that way, but for a lot of people, a three-wheeled car is just not really an answer. You want a four-wheeled car. So we've got, there's all kinds of interesting ideas and ways for making your entirely own car, but regulatory-wise and safety-wise, we've got to figure out what what's going to work and what's going to make sense. And um, let's see, where are we? Oh yeah, so here's that 3D printed body. This was just the Geneva show just last week. It's an entire car body based on the turtle shell as inspiration you kind of see here, printed in 3D. This is a large scale 3D printer. We don't know for sure if this was printed in one unit. It may have been assembled, but there's a lot of really big parts that were put together. I think it's extremely light. It's got this kind of really interesting lattice work. It seems very cool. You know, this is super futuristic looking in terms of yeah. the form factor of a car. I mean, you this would be a, out the, the shape of a car. Yeah, there. I think this would be like a one-seater F1 style thing. You'd have the external mm -hmm. wheels and the drive would sit here. But this is coming. I mean, there's no reason why. And the thing is, if we're going to start going to 3D printing for bodies, something like a platform chassis that's variable that you can put different bodies on all of a sudden becomes even more sensible. So if the idea that you could design at home with some sort of special 3D tools your own car body, let's say you want something that's sort of like a van, but you want a back area with a convertible. In theory, with a standardized platform, you could have something like that. Technically, we could be going down the road where, like in the early 20s, well, in the 1920s and teens, there were coach builders. So you'd buy a chassis from like Packard, and then you'd go to a coach builder, and they'd build you whatever body you wanted. Custom made, even. Custom made. You know, fancy yeah. Or yeah, right. Building. If you wanted it all, you know, dog fur and you know, <laughs> snake skin, they can do that for you. So we may, we may be getting back to that point where that level of customizability is going to be feasible again. And I think that would be fantastic because half the fun of cars is the individuality. Uh, this is okay. So for, you just you want you talk about because you just ordered yeah. these. Uh, so Ford um, has embraced this concept of open hard, uh, uh, open source hardware and open source software. 
to um, basically create an OBD2 port device. Plugs in uh, to the bottom of the OBD2 port and it actually adds two functionalities. It adds uh, Bluetooth, it adds GPS, and it adds a 3G uh, data connection. And these are basically being given to developers. They're about $100 if you want to buy it off of the shelf. And they have a whole, uh, so one of the first hacks that came out of Microsoft was a haptic feedback shift knob. So it was a manual transmission car, and it came with a little app to help um, kids learn how to drive sticks. So it had a little driving trainer, would show you up on the display what your throttle position, in other words, what the pedal position was, what gear you were in, and it would vibrate as you got up to your shift limit, and naturally you just shift and move around instead of what you do with the first time you drive a manual transmission, is stare at the shifter, looking at the one to two note, keep your eyes on the road or, or on this app. But the, the, it was kind of an interesting um, idea. And they're, they're embracing this to see what app developers and hardware developers can create. And some of the little projects besides that, there are some heads up displays um, that people have 3D printed with a solar panel and a little uh, LED segment. So you can see via heads up display how fast you're going and some of these stats. Uh, also, just getting the data out and mapped onto uh, an overlay over a map so you can see your speed or were you driving aggressively, um, what was your mile per gallon, and then, you know, a lot of, uh, in other words, it's in the hands of the developers to start your life. This is very similar to that progressive uh, yeah. snapshot thing. Yeah. yeah. It's very, very, yeah. what is it? Progressive. Snapshot. Snapshot, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really similar in, in hardware. It's just not all your data is getting sent to the insurance company. Right. It's data you can grab and use. Exactly, it's, it's open, close. they have an SDK, yeah. you can download examples for Ruby, for Python, for PHP, and, and just start start going. And this offers all kinds of interesting things you can do. If you're tuning your car, you can get, if you're actually interested in racing or driving in a performance way, you can get interesting data from it. And artwork, I mean, there's, it's great. I love that they're actually making that open. And the, yeah, the fact that Ford, a large oh, you know, exactly. auto manufacturer on top of it, it's United States auto manufacturer, and opened it up and just said, you know, hey kids, let's go. Let's do some. It's it it great. Let's get great speed. Um, so yeah, and then there's um, right now. Apple just announced recently. Is that the yeah? Apple announced their li their licensing. I think it's Volvo, Mercedes, and a couple other companies have signed on. So we're starting to get cars, infotainment computers, actually having a lot of the mainstream OSs. So Google has it. Um, Android will be in cars. iOS. So there's going to be people who might be picking a car soon based on the operating system. You yep. see nuts to me. Yeah, that is bonkers. <laughs> I mean, it should just be an open platform in which you can install which, whichever yeah. software, but that's fine. We'll, we'll get to that point. Yeah, I mean, I think we will get there. I think, <laughs> actually, right now, this is a problem, because if you love a particular car, but its OS is different than everything else you own, yeah. that seems like a ridiculous problem to I have. I mean, if anything, you'd be choosing the drivetrain, and luxury, right. interior. Or how the car drives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Not the technology. So, well, it's cool that they're I don't know. I feel like this is a bad direction in a way. Like actually getting tied to one particular OS for your car's nav and infotainment or whatever. I, I think it will be a lot nicer when these things are just you can flash whatever you want. And they're kind of but I don't know where that's going to go. This may take off and we'll have another OS war. In there. <laughs> so um, yeah, the, the, the point is the people who are hacking cars are the ones who are helping manufacturers see what's interesting and. It's been going on this way for the hundred year or hundred or so years that we've actually had cars, you know, in popular culture, and it's going to continue this way. And the good news is, as cars are getting more complex, there's more possibilities you have in them. Our tools are getting more complex too. There's no reason to be afraid of dealing and working on your car. Like people in the '90s, it was like a weird transition period. So up until like the '80s, we still had like carbureted cars and things that you could physically work with and deal with and see. Once we started getting more advanced types of fuel injection and car computers and things. There was a long period where the tools had caught up. And then people were right. Cars were, for a long time, too complex for regular people to really mess with and work on. You were just kind of getting in trouble unless you were willing to really spend the time. Well, and then came not only just the technology, but the internet. Yeah. And the information age. And now, oh, like, yeah, sites like Instructables we and are, you know, Hackaday and those types of places as a repository for sure. that. If you don't have a factory service manual for your car, if you can't find a PDF one or, online yeah. or something, you can order one. It's so much easier to get stuff. We were talking the other day. If you were growing up in Kansas in the 1970s and you loved DKWs or Wartburgs or Tatras or some weird Eastern European car, good fucking luck finding out anything about those cars. You could go to your library, maybe you'd see a grainy picture <laughs> in a book. Nowadays, you could know everything about that. And it's that way for everything. So, knowledge has increased, our access to knowledge, 
our tools for working with the cars. So it's not that way anymore. You can deal with these sophisticated cars now, and people should. They're your cars. You should mess around with them. Anyhow, so this is a this is a, from a Lemons race. Lemons is a great race for five hundred dollar cheaper cars. You get people doing all kinds of fascinating car hacks, things with double engines. Uh, this one guy, he goes by the name Speedy Cop. He builds all kinds of crazy cars. He built a he turned a Cessna airplane into a car. He made this upside down Camaro car. There's all kinds of things you can do now, and there's no reason to be rational about any of them. So it's just you should have fun as long as you're not getting overtly killed. <laughs> I see no reason why there's not all kinds of ways to like really tear up cars and have a good time with those. Um, we should open it up to yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what do you guys want to talk about? Anybody have any questions or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, when, 